Well, welcome to a very special episode of Experience Focused Leaders. Um, I have an offer to A-B test with you. <laughs> <laughs> whether we're going to talk to Scott Brinker, the VP of Platform Ecosystem at HubSpot, whether we're going to talk to Scott Brinker, the editor and godfather of MarTech Industry, chiefmartech.com, or Scott Brinker, the creator of interactive content category as we know it, which is near and dear to my heart personally. Scott, tremendously excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Yeah, wow. I can't wait to meet all these people. They sound yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> you have to talk in voice. You got to bring your Italian here, you know, and then whatever <laughs> heritage is you got. Um, well, look, uh, you know, there's so much uh, to cover from our point of view, but um, the, let's start at the beginning because what, you know, you've started back in the 90s, a boutique agency that effectively over time turned into kind of creating interactive content as a category. And later in a book that you've written uh, called Hacking Marketing, which is another fun thing for our audience, um, you wrote something that I love, I don't quote you. The most significant ch change that has unlocked opportunities for marketing innovation is this. Marketing is expended from the design and delivery of communications to the design and delivery of experiences. What we tell prospects and customers is still important, but they are, about how they experience touch points with the company has become even more important. Can you tell us about, like, is you still believe this? This is a- uh, I think it's only a more true dated, today but than not it was today. then. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, tell us about this insight, the aha that you've gotten you know, um, in, in kind of building the category of interactive marketing experiences? Well, you know, one of the things about marketing uh, is it is a, um, we'll call it an honorable, right? It's an honorable profession that's been around a really long time, you know? Mm. Uh, and so even before all things digital really started to take hold, you know, there've been so much, uh, so many great leaders and pioneers, uh, you know, I mean, certainly the, the, the Mad Men era, you know, uh, and one of the things from that era was this whole concept of thinking about like, you know, messages and media and the medium is the message. And, yeah. you know, like as, as an industry, and kind of covered it and then we it sounds like we missed we missed the rest of it or like we well first... it's like you know i mean when you think about traditional marketing advertising yeah. you know it was very much purely a communications um i mean you know again there's lots of stuff always on the margin of this stuff but the core you know of what marketing did was really around the communications how do we decide what messages who we're getting them to and how we deliver them and, and as I said then in that uh, quote, um, that hasn't changed. I mean, like understanding our messages, our audience, making sure we get those messages in front of them uh, is still like really crucial to successful marketing. But we now do have this whole other dimension, you know, that people are not just passively consuming messages like a radio ad or a magazine ad or, you know, a piece of direct mail in the, uh, you know, mailbox. You know, they're going to websites, uh, they're engaging to find answers, perhaps participate, you know, in everything from when you start talking interactive uh, content, things like, oh, you know, can I do this assessment? You know, could I run this calculator? Could I, you know, in a very interactive way, learn about the opportunity of working with a particular company? And that's entirely new. Um, and it's it's what's actually, I, all, I really do find it so incredibly exciting because, hey, marketing is a creative profession. And it's almost like we were creating in 2D, you know, and now all of a sudden we've been given permission to like create in like a 3D landscape. Uh, so like just the sheer surface area of creative things we can do to engage customers uh, is greater than ever. But at the same time, this is, this is a new discipline, like we're, we're learning how to do this and do it well. Yeah, and it, it feels like the tragedy is that sometimes the, you know, we take a pull back up outside of marketing almost, the more important the message, the more sophisticated, the nuance, the message, the almost the harder it is uh, for either marketers or sellers 
to turn it into something that moves you, right? Like, like fewer people are going to be reading War and Peace these days, right? You know, like, and yet we're showing up with these War and Peace equivalents in B2B world, right? Black and white, you know, small print, you know, uh, type of content that you need to read on a screen, which you try to shove that War and Peace into in a small <laughs> phone real estate. So I'm I'm with you on, on that. We, like, you know, we've coined... Uh, a derivative actually of Marshall McLuhan and Medium the Message is that experience is the message, right? Like, and it's it's not entirely true. It's a little bit, you know, trivializing the message, but you know, it's the first impression, right? Like the first I think you're was, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, the way I did it was uh, you know, I had the Venn diagram of, you know, messages and media. Uh, and I basically added a third circle to that Venn diagram uh, that I called mechanisms because I'm I love alliteration. So hey, messages, media, mechanisms. But it's exactly the way you've said it is more eloquent. You know, it's really about creating experience. Um, and I think that is the message. Um you know, in many ways, I don't know, it's people have become so saturated with just plain messages that to really break through and leave an impression with someone, it has to be experiential in some sort of way. And I actually do think even in a digital environment, you can deliver things that have an experiential. Experiential, right. You need to be inspired by the real world. Like I'm, you know, how do we like? I kind of was always inspired in friends. They have these little tasty macaroons that you go <laughs> with the patisserie, and you look at them. And some of them, some of them are just plain, and some of them are like have little creations on them. And you're like, and they're tiny, and uh, they're just they're amazing, right? Like you look, you look at them, you cannot but stop and marvel at this. And then the taste is more sophisticated. And so, like, can we make our our you know you know the healthy food? you know, of for the brain feel like that, right? Can we kind of get you to choose, you know, from from the flavor that you just like, right? And I think that's sort of taking these real world metaphors from people that know how to create great experiences um, feels like yeah. this is what the industry needs in digital. Um, well, you're, you know, tell, but tell me like when you were an agency, right? Like you started... I'm curious that journey, mm -hmm. like from an agency to building a you know software to address this. What what were you know? Because we started almost the 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 opposite way. We started like I'm a software person. Like, hey, can we build the software? But interestingly, we found that you needed to to build the software to really understand how to create truly great experience. You also need to be you know really close to the customer. And I think sometimes agents as an agency you actually get a privilege to do that, right? And so what what was your lesson in kind of building I am? Um, yeah, and we kind of did a full circle on that. Um, you know, so the way uh, we got started in interactive content is we were effectively a web agency. So we were getting hired by these companies to build out their massive website. But, you know, when you talk about a website for a Fortune 500, it's still true today, but it's even more true back then that these things did not change quickly. You know, right? There's a lot of process and review and what's going to be the information architecture and how's this going to live? And if I want to add something new, it's not something that you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, I'd like to add this other thing over here. Just the way the our sites were architected in that uh, age, they just didn't even have that surface area. But at the same time, you know, all these marketing teams were like trying to run all these new digital campaigns and how do I bring people to stuff? Oh, do I need a microsite? Do I need a landing page? Uh, and it was just really awkward to create that stuff. And so that's yeah. what originally, you know, inspired us to create a software saying like, listen, this isn't meant to build your website. Right. This is meant to build all of the other kinds Market, of like, like marketing assets, sales. Yeah. Oriented. Okay. Got it. You know, and we called it post-click marketing at the time, a phrase that never really quite took off. But yeah, it was this idea. You do all this investment in winning the click. How much effort are you doing in, you know, on the other side of where you receive the click? And so we built that, we shifted out of being an agency into being a software company. It is as challenging of a transition as people say it is. I, we probably were too dumb to realize how challenging it was going to be, uh, but somehow actually made it through. Uh, but then, you know, the thing we found on the other end is even once we had the software that was capable of building all these things, it was very clear that this was such a new net new capability, such a net new skill 
the customers didn't know yeah. what to build. They didn't know how to build, you know. And you're so talking to a marketer, it. you're not talking to a web designer. And so they they weren't thinking in that in that year. Yeah. And it wasn't even like classic web design, right? These like little, you know, experiences, yeah. they were kind of like a new form. Um, you know, and so we actually then started to layer back in more service offerings, yeah. you know partly to teach people how to fish. Uh, yeah. But if I'm being honest, in more than a few cases, it's like they just want us to feed them the fish. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> we'll do that too. Well, and I think kind of the, you, you've taken like the sort of the, the survey, the interactive, like deep, deep kind of surveys and questionnaires and calculators, they're complicated kind of experiences. So I think it's not a trivial to go and figure that out on your own, I, I would I would say, but I think to, you're right, you were creating a category. And I think people don't recognize, like I, having done a few of these in the past, this is very hard. And I think to do that, you created this term interactive content to kind of differentiate from static, right? And started educating as in traditional, you know, the PDF and uh, Certain, you yes, know, although I, I will give credit where credit is due, um, although we had been building this software, I think we were one of the first to actually build software for this. Uh, at the time, we were sort of framing it around landing pages and yeah. post-click experiences. Uh, landing pages was terrible because it became a commoditized term, uh, and post-click experiences, people just didn't know what that meant. Uh, I think it was, boy, I'm trying to remember his name, Seth. Uh, the fellow from Snap App, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he, were... he was the one who actually started calling this stuff interactive content. And the moment I heard that, I was like, yes, yeah, that's, that's that is one. the way to frame that's that. So, yeah, it. giving credit where credit is due. <laughs> well, look, you're you're uh, you're uh, clearly your marketing of the, you're, you're in the category creation. The ones that you think created the category, the ones that. You know, uh, well, I'll give him. I'll, I'll give him uh, credit for the. But we'll term. give it, thank you. Know, you we'll take a little credit for yeah, yeah. Uh, contributing to the category. But but you've done <laughs> a lot of educating on that, and I think that was one of the things. So we stand on your shoulders. Well, that was one of the things that inspired us at you know at starting relate to, and you know, I actually want to refer to another example from one of your speeches that I loved, where you talked about the presentation, where the presentation, um, fifty years ago was like a custom creation. Uh, and you know, effectively, then PowerPoint comes in and creates the the first sort of democratization, oh, yeah, yeah. like for citizen, like the first version of citizen creators. Really, was Microsoft Office, right? Like, if we are like in, like honest about it, and I was at Microsoft circa Office ninety seven, launching some internet capability in there, and I loved it. Back then, it was not evil at all, right? The, the, it was actually really an inspiring thing because, like, a, a schmuck like me could go and create something, you know, hopefully without too many weird, you know, weird, uh, you know, animation things, but it was sort of still empowering to be a creator back then. And I think the at the same time, what they've done, and this is sort of like interesting parallel um, to something that I'm worried about today is they've, you know, they've made it, be, to make it easy for creators, they simplified it and say, hey, you just create a bunch of bullets because bullets are the lowest common denominator. And so we were all kind of got into this multi-bullet hell, right? Of like, yeah. um, you know, or and like we don't have, we don't set the templates. They didn't invest in the templates. It was all about, you know, creation. So the templates weren't really sophisticated. And so only the specialists could create a really compelling experience. So that first revolution did, you know, do democratize creation. Then there's this wave you know, let's call it collaboration wave, right? Like we, let's call yeah. Google Slides, Google Docs, right? Like, okay, it's still same ugly shit, but now it's a little bit easier to collaborate with it. So like, which is a, a problem, a real problem. And and I think with AI, like I'm actually quite worried that, you know, we're now unleashing into the world a bunch of tools that are going to help people create more pseudo spammy AI email, you know, things. And, you know, the types of content that really you know, is me, me, me much more versus mm -hmm. customer centric, kind of like encourage some of the older habits of like simplifying the creator and not really starting kind of like was the interactive content, which is like, hey, you actually want to create a great experience for somebody. You don't overwhelming somebody with a ton of information in the day and age where information is not a scarce commodity anymore is not 
you know, a recipe to a great buying experience. It's a recipe to being ignored. You know, what's your take on that? Like, cause you're, you, we, you, you know, you've obviously championing citizen creators and I want to come back to that, but like, that's a worry trend for me of like the current focus on Gen AI. I think, I think that's an absolutely fair concern. Um, in fact, uh, I don't know, maybe six months or so ago, I uh, wrote a piece I was thinking about the second, what I call the second order effects of AI that, you know, okay, if the first order effect is AI allows you to create a whole bunch more content, um, you know, what's a second order effect? Oh, your like audiences are going to be even more overwhelmed and more spammed and are going to like find ways to put even more barriers uh, up. As, as if that spam sequence was not enough that you get <laughs> you know yeah no i mean like hell like again like you know it's not even creating the content i mean like these ai agents actually can do the full life cycle like they can create the content send the content like you don't even have to be involved you know and so when the marginal cost you know of basically doing unlimited you know outbound pushing to uh, you know prospects becomes zero um, yeah, I mean, it's very logical to assume that, okay, well, everyone's going to engage in that. Now, what's interesting is there's two possible solutions to that, and I don't know that they're mutually exclusive, but one is you're going to see the buyers actually start to embrace technologies to go from a, what is it, like, um, you know, the recipient of this stuff to be like, no, no, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to pay attention to any of this. I'm going to have my own agent and I'm going to yeah. tell my agent, go out and get X, Y, Z for me. Yeah. And increasingly it's going to be on the marketers to make sure that when these agents, you know, are requesting things on behalf of a buyer, you know, that they can serve them up, but we're not only going to interact with agents. So the other way in which I think there's a huge opportunity is the, the experiential dimension yeah. of this. It's like, basically if everyone else is pumping out crap, yeah. You know, the opportunity for you to do something different, you know, something that is remarkable, something that, you know, wins the engagement of the audience on the like just on the merit, you know, of it. Wow, this is so much better or nicer than, you know, what I've yeah. seen everywhere else can actually be a real brand building opportunity. Opportunity. Yeah. I this is sort of this feels like not to tout like our our horn because I think we've been working on this, but it feels like it's almost becoming a um like the next step from generative AI should be some sort of like customer focused uh, customer obsessed AI. We call it interactive AI because we're more in this interactive world. But like whatever you call it, like don't start with like you know out output. You know, like or in like low input, high high output crap type of thing. Start with the outcome. What's the outcome that you're trying to achieve, and then work backwards, right? Like the good, good old classic Steve Jobs thing. Like start mm -hmm. with the customer and work backwards. Sounds, yeah. you know, sounds like we're forgetting that and getting too excited in the friction removal uh, component of it. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right. And and I think something that you've also like I'm, I'm I'm as you can see I'm a fan like you you've spoke you've spoke about the sort of the citizen creators, um, movement and I think that actually one thing that I found was interesting in there is that um, to really use a tool like Webflow which by the way we you know we do, we do use and we'll come back to to kind of to how we use HubSpot like it's actually it's a kind of a citizen creator tool but it's like it's in a world where not all citizens are created equal and it's very <laughs> much for the citizens that have the time and attention to do it and then you know figma which is the the star like for most people that are not designers just the zoom interface alone already confuses confuses them and they're like gone the moment you send them the figma the figma library of, of stuff so what we're seeing is that this sort of citizen creation world you know kind of bifurcates a little bit so there's these sophisticated yeah. tools that like create great stuff right and then there is the rest of us that are going to be creating like more spammy emails because that's relatively easy and we think like or like the kind of back to the powerpoint example and so one of the kind of ways that which we are building on your legacy 
is we said, well, if most people know how to create a, you know, a PowerPoint, and let's say it's easier to show somebody, give somebody a good template for a PowerPoint than teach them how to use a no code you know, platform for an average marketer, average seller, maybe even some designers that are more graphic designers, like that are living in InDesign world versus web design world. Can we enable them to become citizen creators, right? Can you take a PowerPoint user and help them create a better customer experience and at least kind of helping people navigate through that, you know, library of content that they're sharing as a customer? What are your thoughts on that kind of citizen, you know, the the divide in the sort of the 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 no code tools that are like super simple, but you know, not tell the full story and just play like very niche versus like, all right, let's enable the the average person, you know, to be successful with no code. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny because I do get a lot of pushback. Like every time I'm talking about the no code stuff and citizen creators, citizen developers, I get pushback saying from people saying like, oh, well, it's not the coding itself or something like that. It's the depth of skill of understanding what to code and how to code. And I will acknowledge, yes, that is a factor. But there are two other factors that those people forget about. You know, when you talk about building something amazing, one thing is like, oh, do I actually have the skills to understand how to design something great? But the other two things are, do I really understand the problem? Because yeah. very often you have a bunch of people who are like super skilled at things and they get hired or brought in to solve something, but they don't really know the problem. They don't really live the problem versus mm. like these citizen, you know, creators, developers, like they're living the problem. They see it, you know, and the third component of that that can't be underestimated, in my opinion, is passion, you know, mm. because the people who are in the middle of living that and they see the problem and they want it solved for their customer, for themselves, and they're passionate about it. That's something that's very hard to get when you're filing a ticket, you know, and hoping that someone else, you know, in like a central design group or a central IT group is going to solve this for you. And so, yes, there's a balance here, you know, skill matters. But I feel like that depth of understanding, that being close to the problem and having a real passion and willpower, you know, to like solving it are like two huge assets in favor of citizen developers, citizen creators. And I think the the technical skill part is in some ways easier to He's search for up, the right. gap from the technology. The understanding the problem and the like having the passion for how to solve that, you can't, you, there is no software that gives you that. Uh, well, there, like the, <laughs> the contra argument could be, there could be a streamlined path, right? There could be a playbook, right? And so what we're seeing is Airtable has certain playbooks that it knows how to do really well. And then it's at the same time capable of doing everything else but it's not as going to be a playbook, right? Same with monday.com. How are you seeing that kind of where, where you basically start democratizing the democratization, so to speak, with these with the playbooks that help you say, okay, you may not be an expert in how to solve a particular, you know, so, you know so dilemma. In our case, we're no code for content hubs, for example, right? Like which have specific industry or other things, right? So if we give you an example, an easy way to get to that version, then people sort of say, oh, I see how other people have solved that particular problem. And I could spend, wait, save some cycles making, you know, an enthusiastic error, you know, in solving it. Have, are you seeing that kind of as a movement? And you probably see some of that was a range of, you know, various ranges of HubSpot users, right? Because we have people that are kind of digging in and figuring out everything that's possible was in the sort of the no code, you know, and the power features was, was in HubSpot. And then you have folks that are, you know, they need, somebody needs to set up a calendar integration for them, you know, because they, that will be overkill for, you know, for an average yeah. person. No, no, no. And I, I, I get it. It's almost like there's a universe of people, you right. know, and it used to be that there was this very small subset of experts who mm -hmm. were the only ones who could actually get any of these technical things done. And so anything that anyone wanted in the broader universe had to be filtered through and queued up through that small group of experts. Where I see the whole citizen developer, citizen creator, no code movement, all this stuff going, is it's expanding the universe of people who can do this. And yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean 
everyone can do that or that everyone wants to do that, you know, but if we can go from a world where, you know, I mean, whatever it is, pick a number, you know, say there's, I believe the current estimate is something like 30 million software developers, you know, in the world, you yeah. know, if we can go from, you know, there's 8 billion, 9 billion people in the world. So half you know, a million, half 500 million, half a billion PowerPoint users, right? Let's see. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so it's like, Hey, listen, if I can go, from that 30 million, and if I can expand the circle to say even 300 million, which is an order of magnitude, a 10x, you know, yeah. increase in the bandwidth, you yeah. know, that is available. The fact that, okay, well, not all 9 billion people, you know, have this capability or necessarily even want this capability. It's still a huge, you know, leap forward in just like the sheer bandwidth, you know, of what we're able to do collectively in the digital world. Yeah, this is this is really really interesting. I think one of the things that I wanted to give you a shout out and the hop spot is like as being one of the enablers for creating um this sort of the superpower. So for example, we are huge fans. We are customers ourselves. But more importantly, one of the things that we've noticed that people start doing is like HubSpot you, in sales, you have your meeting widget, right? Like, so we talked about that kind of the, the ability to book your meetings and they go directly into HubSpot. And, you know, so imagine, you know, now you have just a link to that in, in your PowerPoint or in your PDF. And then like what we're doing, what we're seeing is people love, you know, moving that and relate to that widget becomes interactive you know, immediately on click, it sort of allows you to book a meeting and then continue consuming the content. And the same could be with a HubSpot form, right? You could have consumed a form, filled out a ticket, and then like started looking up for some additional information. So, so HubSpot has created a bunch of these sort of mini apps within with itself within a platform. You play nice with other apps, right? That do the same thing and you know you start you know your the data that's being fed the kind of as a marketing in the organizations that choose um your marketing automation you're basically the marketing system of record connecting connecting the data so tell us a little bit about this vision that that you have you know how you are kind of helping create value for other players in the ecosystem like us that relate to you know wearing that hat and you know what's What's changing there in your view, right? Like this, you're kind of at the hot seat of creating a new ecosystem, right? Probably outside of Salesforce App Exchange, which has been around there for a while, right? You're kind of in the marketing world. You're creating the the next most dynamic uh, thing for creating a different mar you know segment of customers, obviously. So we'd love to learn from you. Yeah, well, I mean, so this is uh, you know one of these things that. Um... You know, for the past 15, 16 years, I've been writing uh, the Chief Martech blog, um, you know, three or so years into that, around 2010, 2011, I started doing these maps of like, well, what are the different Martech solutions? Uh, and we thought there were a lot when it was like 100 or 200. Uh, and then it's just like, it went crazy. It's, you know, thousands and thousands. Um, and in many ways, like the amount of innovation in these products is incredible. I mean, the amount of people who are like bringing really interesting new ideas, uh, putting a lot of brain power and collaborative, you know, innovation is incredible. But, you know, on the marketer's end, yeah, this explosion of all these little different things out here, you know, was very frustrating in um, how do I get these things to work together? How do I integrate them? Because even if a piece of something is like really powerful, if I can't connect it into the overall customer journey and the way in which we measure this stuff and get funding for stuff and connect campaigns and programs together, it, it, it's it's hard to really tap into that. Right. Um, so like a classical example, just to illustrate for our users. So if I capture a lead somehow and it goes in, a, in either an internal system or in a spreadsheet of some kind, Right, that's not as valuable that if I have a mark, you know, HubSpot, and that, that when I capture that lead, let's say through like through like for our customers through through relate to that lead would get you know could could go directly into my HubSpot, um, uh, HubSpot set, or I may not need to have that lead form because I know that they're already a customer because I have HubSpot deployed. So that's sort of really interesting way to create lower friction experiences and get richer data about like, hey, this customer is interested, you know, this lead is interested in all this particular information. And then you could feed that to your marketing 
orchestration to your sales team uh, through the platform. Am I kind of illustrating with that sort of the, the flow of the data in a concrete way to some, some folks that are pretty tactical in, in terms of- Yeah, no, I think that's a very, yeah, uh, straightforward way of like looking at, uh, yeah, how do you get these things connected together? Um, the data is the most foundational layer. Uh, to that. And actually, in today's age, with all the stuff happening around AI and, you know, much more sophisticated machine learning we're doing with data and all this, like getting all that data connected together um, in your internal ecosystem is, uh, yeah, more valuable than ever. Yeah. And so I think you, there's sort of different platforms, right? Like there's sort of the LD AWS and Azure and like people, you know, Google Cloud. So people think of them sometimes as the platforms, but they're like almost in a lower level and then there's like you you know the api type of solutions right you're connecting a, a really what i like about hopspot is you're really connecting you know marketing to sales to customer so you're creating kind of a front office so to speak you know full cycle customer journey and like i want to come back to that in a second um because i feel like one of the challenges in martech is that it only thinks about marketing but actually some things need to flow from marketing to sales to, you know, to, to CS team to be effective, particularly in content. But you're sort of building this, the platform of platforms to some degree, because then like people like us that were saying, well, you know, we are focused on, you know, different content types, for example, right? Presentations, flip books, videos, et cetera, you know, um, scrollable microsites. And then we could, we would, we are kind of a platform, right? We call ourselves a platform, but in reality, we're like a you know midget of a platform compared to HubSpot because we can then sit on top of, you know, you're the mega platform that you're doing. But I think that isn't there a movement right now was confusion, uh, you know, a lot of like niche vendors that are like, ah, I've been doing flip books for 20 years and we'll just keep doing flip books, you know, type of things that are sort of stuck in one little niche. You know, it, it, like, do you feel like the customers are fed up with that and they want to move to platforms, mega platforms like HubSpot, you know, maybe sub platforms like what we're doing um, to simplify their life? What, what's your take on this, you know, move? Yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, and it's interesting because like this thing about platforms on platforms, that actually goes deep, right? I mean, like uh, HubSpot is built on uh, some of the cloud infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, platforms, things like AWS and yeah. Google Cloud. And there's some interesting things you can do within those ecosystems. And then you're right, HubSpot is a platform and we have other products that are built on top of ours or integrate with ours, but they yeah. in turn then have their own ecosystems. Yeah. And there's even a few cases where you find ecosystems on top of the ecosystem. So yeah. it's like the old philosophy joke, turtles all the way down. It's like, oh, it's uh, ecosystems all the way down. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, what people are looking for, in fact, maybe this ties back to where we started. We were talking about all the noise, you know, in the market, uh, you know, from just a marketing messaging perspective. In many ways, technology is another example where there's just so much noise. There's so yeah. much here. People are looking for ways to find a path through yeah. all of this, find cohesion. And I think this concept of platforms and ecosystems is a concrete way to say like, okay, well, if you decide to participate in an ecosystem like this, the big benefit is you now know a set of things that are going to work together, um, you know? And so that's, I, I, I think that's more important now for, you know, buyers than it ever has been. Yeah. So it's important for buyers. And so let's, if we start with the buyers, right? Like one of my questions is like, do buyers really care whether, you know, what's your MarTech stack versus your sales tech stack versus your customer success tech mm -hmm. stack? And my answer is obviously no, they don't give a flying whatever, right? And so, yeah, like, you know, you've obviously like did a, did a leading job in, in like educating the MarTech discipline, but I'm sure you kind of see more than anyone, some of the kind of overlaps, right? Like, so, you know, to us, like in our little niche world, like if you create a presentation, right? It could be top of the funnel marketing type of presentation. It could be middle of the funnel. It could be bottom of the funnel, which then starts middle and the bottom starts getting used in the, in the client engagement kind of ABM campaigns. Then they move into proposals, right? It's still the same potentially presentation that your same case study 
that could be moving across the journey. And then since everybody's now on subscription universe, right, then like once they set up to a customer, they could come back to that came to study to upsell to a new product or learn how to, you know, get value from the product that they bought. And, and yet, like, I see I like something that just, I get this edgy feeling because I see very little of that discussion. And even though like you get the sort of the new titles, like, you know, I'm, I'm a revenue marketer or like I'm a, you know, chief revenue officer, but it's typically like a form, you know, former VP of sales, just get like a little mini promotion as gets called the chief revenue officer. They still don't really go deep into marketing. And that worries me, like, because it sort of is the opposite. It creates these sort of barriers, right. And, in, in you know, the, you know, so you're kind of, you've, you've created an ecosystem that connects the dots, but I think a lot of people in the ecosystem, you know, my worries, they're still playing in their little niche. And, you know, I wonder what's your take on that. Are you seeing changes there? Uh, I mean, first, I, I, I do feel like we should acknowledge that the amount of change that is yeah. happening in not just marketing, but yeah, the broader go-to-market world. Um, I mean, my goodness, things were largely well-established here for, you know, decades, if not right. potentially even centuries, you know, uh, you know, and sort of these patterns of how things work. And in the past couple decades, oh my goodness, the pace of change in the world, you know, has been insane. It's truly gone exponential. And you have all these different organizations and all these different professionals who are trying to figure this out. And we're asking a lot. I mean, change is hard, uh, you know, particularly for, you know, the larger an organization gets, the harder it gets, you know. And so I always, while I agree, there are definitely these gaps, you know, and people aren't necessarily thinking about or able to operationalize what really the best practice today should be. Mm -hmm. I also give a little bit of empathy of like, okay, well, I mean, you know, these best practices and the way it should be are pretty darn new. Um, and so and they change every couple of years. Yeah, <laughs> they, they do. It's, it's a really fast moving thing. So this is, again, another reason why I kind of like the ecosystem concept is because in an ideal world, you're right. Every participant is going to look across the entire ecosystem and really be focused on how do you optimize the whole. But in reality, we know there's going to be a number of folks who are like, well, I actually just know this piece and I'm going to focus on doing this piece really, really well. But if you can plug that sort of specialist narrow view into an environment that's connected across the broader ecosystem, that actually can work out okay because like they're focusing on a very, it's almost like specialization, you know, I mean, like I've got all these cells in my body, you know, my kidney is very different, you know, than, you know, perhaps my brain is synthesizing a lot of this stuff, but my kidney, it's kind of focused on just doing one thing of like cleaning the bloodstream and, you know, move on. And, you know, that's okay, you know, because as long as the ecosystem is working and the contributions it's doing can be relied on, you know, by the rest of the ecosystem, then, yeah, maybe it doesn't have to have the, you know, big picture in mind. So the implication is, is you have to be narrow, but you have to play nice within the ecosystem. If you're going to be narrow, if you're going to be narrow, definitely you have to play nice. nice. You may not solve yeah. <laughs> the global problem. Um, but I, 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 you know, I kind of still see that the the sort of bifurcation, you know, is sort of the bane of like the the, the one thing that hasn't changed is the marketing complains about sales and sales complains about marketing, and that that is you know you know that sort of narrative and in B two B world it's pretty problematic for marketers, right? Because if the marketers, you know, they, they deliver their, you know, their MQLs and, you know, some, some kind of version of whatever their kind of KPIs are, but the sales team doesn't truly kind of see that convert into real, real deals or a kind of emotional support behind marketing is a lot of CMOs struggle. Like, and there's a high turnover in the industry as a result of that. So kind of on that particular dimension, like we, you know, one of our hypotheses is that they're not using the same tools, which makes it hard to communicate, right? Like, so the, the you know, the marketing creator may be an InDesign. And if you send an InDesign file to a, you know, salesperson, they'll, they'll be kind of overwhelmed with something like that, right? Like the data sets may, you kind of connect the dots, right? Like, because you have Mark, you know, your HubSpot CRM and HubSpot, you know, um, you know, marketing automation working really, really well between sales and marketing. But in general, like 
some people fall fall there that they can't use each other's systems or the data issues. So what would be your advice to folks that are kind of in marketing um, or MarTech, but really realize that, you know, at the end of the day, either they deliver the revenue somehow directly through the PLG driven marketing motion, or they kind of, they get this, the sales team to be their biggest champions, right? And and kind of advocate for more marketing investment or let's hire more more reps and kind of get more spammy messages out through sort of, you know, the SDR playbook, right, of 2000s, right? Like, so kind of what's your take there on like an advice, especially having, you know, now maybe me wearing both a, a HubSpot and a MarTech hat yeah i mean this is it's funny okay so there's like basically two perennial things uh that are just always hard one is um change that's just hard um the second is cross-team collaborations that's just hard um you know because this tension between marketing and sales i mean i come from a background where i mean the whole reason i started my blog was because of this crazy tension between marketing and it yeah. Um, you know, we now hear increasingly, uh, you know, in this ever more data instrumented world, you know, finance is playing a much stronger hand in like, what exactly is marketing doing here and how it's proving it? And so now you've got cross collaboration tension happening between marketing and finance. And I'm like, I don't know that there's a silver bullet. It's the same thing with change. It's always going to be hard. Some companies really invest in getting better at change, or they really invest in trying to get this better cross org collaboration and really try and build that into their culture. And I think those companies who do get better at cross team collaboration, get better at change management, have a huge advantage in this world where things are changing quickly and everything is so interconnected, you know, that the success of one part of the organization has a huge impact on the success of the rest of the pieces. And so, yeah, I, I, I say you got to like lean into it, you know, like how can marketing serve sales better? You know, how can sales like help marketing be more successful? IT, finance, yeah. you know, customer success, right? You know, this whole thing about like the feedback loop. I mean, you know, uh, keeping a customer, you know, such a better ROI than having to win a net new one. So what's the relationship between operations and customer support and customer service and marketing? It's just... <laughs> no easy answer. Well, I think one, I think one uh, that is there for me and I'm kind of... Uh... Maybe just by virtue of you know being more in the entrepreneurial kind of you know high growth companies, I had a chance to switch from marketing to sales role in in the past life, and I think that really like opened my eyes because when I was a marketer cranking out some stuff, like and even though those making the best effort, I totally underestimated you know the sales perspective and sales enablement perspective at consuming some of that content. So my hypothesis on this is that. One of the ways to drive that kind of collaboration is for marketers to really, especially with the PLG, that kind of the best marketers really need to think, like, how do we replicate what the best salespeople do with our, with, you know, educating about our products through our marketing collaterals, through product, interactive product tours, or whatever it is that to create a kind of a sales-like marketing content and vice versa the sales team i think needs to, like to, to back to the experiences point S sales team needs to up its game and ask for delivery of like really you know experiences right that right now they're not necessarily equipped to create and there's there's very little of that like you know occasionally you see like a proposal designer right sitting closer to sales organization and some folks that are doing sophisticated things like we've been fortunate to work with people who have like account based opportunities so like that's like you 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 get a marketer to work on a that's like the top of abm food chain in terms of stuff but that's rare that's an exception not the rule so kind of i think that what so may, maybe what you're saying is like find these exchanges or like start doing like tu tutorials like you know get the marketers embedded inside sales organizations and vice versa. Um, uh, and, and I think to me, like back to the tools, like because the tools do define us to some degree, right? Like, and so if we 
you know, if we think of the tools in a niche way, you know, and you're helping unlock that was HubSpot, right? Where you could serve in the connected way that might help um, get get us a common language for data and through the tools that, that we're using. Um, so that's my view. More back to you, like you're seeing, you have a pattern matching of, of Chief Martech, right? And you're kind of at the, at the intersection of a lot of exciting things happening at HubSpot. So, you know, I know you like to do some predictions and talk about the future. Um, you know, what are some of the key trends that you see emerging that you want to leave our audience with and kind of that they should, you know, stay on top of to either, you know, engage, you know, give success to their organizations or, or in their career? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, and it's also, I always feel like I need to caution that um, if I've learned one thing over all these years of tracking MarTech, um, predicting the future is hard. Like, I don't think I've, I mean, yeah, it's just like, particularly at the rate at which things are changing, you know, I mean, for instance, I would say the obvious statement that you should be paying attention to what's happening here with AI, particularly generative AI, because it is very rapidly changing what people are capable of doing, what organizations are capable of doing. Um, but if you ask me to predict like, okay, well, what will that look like three, five years from now? Heck, if I know, man, uh, it is, um, it's it's just on such a fast acceleration pace. So not predictions, but I would say three things that I would be looking at. I'd be trying to stay on top of is one okay. is how these AI capabilities are evolving. Um, you know, you got to, this is going to change what you can do uh, in marketing. So you, you, you better be on top of it. Um, the second is what's happening at the data layer. You know, we're getting a lot better at being able to unify data across organizations. We're getting pretty savvy now about leveraging data across ecosystems, you know, with partners as well to lean into that data. And part of it is because data feeds what's possible with AI, you know. And then the third thing is, you know, where we're talking about these citizen creators is I think, again, as a function of AI, the empowerment of more people to self-service more of their ideas and more of their needs is going to be a huge unlock in like expertise and passion and just sheer bandwidth. Um, and so I'd sort of stay on top of that. I'm sure there's lots of other things, but those are yeah. the three things that I, I spend most of my days now paying attention to and thinking about because it's really exciting the pace at which that's evolving. And, and so to kind of wrap up on your kind of come back to your, three roles hopefully we covered kind of your 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 books and thought leadership your the chief martech and, and the hop spot and and also the obviously the, the the story of interactive content um you know we'll still give you credit even though you didn't coin the term uh but scott uh, you know what what do you think um um the kind of the biggest takeaway from your more recent experience at hop spot you know, and how HubSpot is changing, right? Like there's changes in leadership. There's, um, you know, obviously AI is, you know, you know, you know, is introducing a lot of opportunities and and changes for you guys. What have you learned from the way kind of an organization like HubSpot is addressing this changing environment? And by the way, like we love one of the reasons a lot of people love HubSpot is that, you know, you're great at executing marketing yourself, right? In terms of inbound you know, as a, as a, as a term. And, you know, we personally relate to love inbound leads that we see show up in our, you know, through G2 or something like that show up in our, in, you know, in, in our uh, hooks into, into um, HubSpot, you know, and so like that, you know, you guys have innovated on that. What is kind of give you the HubSpot's innovation going forward? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, again, it kind of comes back to uh, this thing about change. Yeah. You know, HubSpot just uh, on multiple levels is a company that has to get really good uh, at change. It has to get uh, good with change because HubSpot's growing. Uh, you know, we, we've gone from being, you know, a company that was not too long ago, just like a startup, you know, just sort of breaking through, you know, to something that is now like a multi-billion dollar business has, you know, aspirations to serve an even larger set of audiences out there. It's you know, increasingly also going up market and serving larger businesses as well too. Uh, so keeping up with the change to really be able to do that well and serve those customers well. 
Uh, and then there's the external change. You know, it's yeah. all the stuff that's happening. I mentioned with AI and yeah. data and, you know, citizen greater stuff. I mean, this is all core into, you know, HubSpot's market. And so we have to continually change and adapt uh, to those new capabilities so that we can help customers take advantage of what's happening with those trends too. Well, one thing that you brought up, like that, like we sort of see with HubSpot is there's subspots that originally was that was more sales and marketing driven versus PLG driven. And it's become in some ways very PLG driven in some, some products. And then you get the same time you mentioned you're moving up in the enterprise. So how is that like how typically that's a tension for most companies, right? Like, like of, of trying to combine those two. So is this, is this sort of, you just have different groups and teams and, and they're kind of, they're just sort of bifurcating the world a little bit to try to, you know, do both or like, how are you executing that? Cause that's pretty hard. We, we have like PLG and enterprise and, yeah. you know, some days your head is about to explode and how do you combine the trade-offs for both? And, you know, we, we don't have the scale of HopSpot. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> curious how you guys pull it off and obviously prioritizing your ecosystem around that as well. Yeah. Well, again, I'd say uh, it's not so much that we're going after enterprise, like not companies with tens of thousands of employees. For us, it's small businesses, 5, 10, 20, 50, up to what we consider the mid-market, 100, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000, you know. And so it's a, still a somewhat uh, reasonable scope. Um, but yeah, you know, there are aspects of that that lend themselves really well to product-led growth uh, motions. And then there's other aspects of it that require, you know, the higher touch of engagement, you know, with, uh, you know, sales or CS reps. And so I think HubSpot's sort of guiding philosophy here is let customers buy the way customers want to buy. And as it turns out, there's a set of things where actually customers prefer to do a PLG thing. They don't want to talk to a sales rep. They just want to yeah. do, you know, they know what they want. Just yeah. let me do it. Um, you know, and then there's other cases where, you know, prospects actually want to talk to someone to be able to, you know, go through different scenarios or perhaps talk about like multiple other stakeholders. And so I don't think it's they're, they're opposed to each other. It's just you need to make it really clear to your audience like, hey, listen, these are paths available to you. What would serve you best? Got it. Well, I know one thing after this conversation. I want to talk to Scott Brinker again. This was really, really helpful uh, and insightful. And thank you for letting me. I, I normally don't talk that much, but I'm so excited about some of the things that you've done that I kind of wanted to you know, bounce some ideas around with you. So thank you so much for being open to that, Scott. You know how can how can our audience engage um, with um, you know ecosystem work you're doing at HubSpot or was was chief marketer? Yeah, um, well, thanks for having me here. Really enjoyed this conversation. Um, yeah, uh, I used to say on Twitter, but I guess it's X uh, now. I'm at Chief Martech without the H at the end, uh, or SJ Brinker on LinkedIn. Uh, and then, yeah, certainly uh, come to ecosystem.hubspot.com if you want to take a look at what we're doing there. Amazing. Please do, everyone. Scott Brinker, thank you so much for being on the pod. All right. Thank you so much, Alex.